So I'll just gently remove the excess. And anything that's near that uh, crack I'll leave alone so that it can in fact uh, use all that it needs as it dries. There we go. While that glue was drying on the stock, I gathered together everything that I would have needed to fiberglass reinforce that uh, stock uh, where the uh, breaks across the green were. Uh, this is this is these are pinking shears which cut which cut the fiberglass cloth so you don't end up with this uh, raveling here like this. I wouldn't have needed much. Uh, fiberglass cloth is very strong when used in conjunction with resin like this. This is this is not marine resin, but it works the same way. Uh, I just simply um, it simply adheres the cloth uh, to the uh, wood very very solidly. Now. I also had a uh, Dremel tool with a drum sander on it with coarse sandpaper and this would have relieved the stock and reduced its uh, thickness uh, the, same, the same amount as the reinforcing fiberglass cloth. Well, you know, I, I, don't, like to do, I don't like to do unnecessary work, especially work that might uh, alter the original um, appearance of a rifle in the original structure of a rifle. Uh, and one of the things that you can do is assess simply what you, uh, what you have accomplished in the process. Now, when I began, you know, if you go back to the beginning of this video, when I began, this, this, gro this, this was a grossly uh, broken uh, stock. Uh, it, was, it was broken across the grain here and here. It was split lengthwise right down the, right down the middle in more than one place, uh, in, in two or three locations along these uh, bridges and back in here and everything. Well, you know, everything is 100% back to its original. Uh, there, are, there are no voids whatsoever. Every bit of that, that tight bond glue, which is this stuff here, this is a, this is a uh, interior, exterior grade, extremely high grade uh, very strong glue which makes wood fibers stronger than they were initially. So, and I say that with complete confidence because I've done a lot of cabinet work where uh, cabinet door frames are held together with finger joints which are uh, finger joints and various types of um, uh, joints that are uh, coupling wood together at corners and uh, it provides extremely good strength that uh, allows for a cabinet door to be used for many, many years. Uh, through generations without falling apart. So <clears throat> what you have to assess is anything is, the strength of anything is measured uh, in compressive strength, that's compression, tension, which is pulling, pulling from one end to the other, torsion, which is, that's where you get the term torque, torsion is this sort, and shear strength, which rips like that. Well, so what you can do is assess the joint and see if that, if any of those conditions apply. Well, there is no, there is no problem with compressive strength because any compressive strength will push these fibers together rather than pull them apart. There is no torsion, uh, there's no torsion involved, there's no twisting of the uh, wood fibers in any way because the the mechanical structure of the um, barreled action will actually be just sitting in there uh, passively. Uh, there's not going to be any uh, tension pulling fibers apart uh, from each other because uh, there's no there's no situation where uh, there's any pulling of uh, fibers. There's no shear there's no shear strength involved that will uh, caused any ripping of the fibers. Uh, now, <clears throat> if I had if I had two pieces of wood, if this joint right here uh, had failed uh, because it was a uh, perfectly straight break across uh, the grain, then I would certainly reinforce it because uh, even even the strongest glue, when it's held together in a butt joint isn't going to last. It's just going to, it's just going to break with the slightest, with the slightest uh, of any kind of uh, 
physical action on it. So that would not have been a wise move to simply uh, glue those fibers together such as that. But whenever you have a something which creates uh, fingers in the joint, whether it's a spline, uh, as you would insert a, a, a spline down a grooved uh, two pieces of wood, or if you have finger joints, uh, and that's exactly what you have right here. Is you've got a finger joint, which is a it's a jagged it's a jagged edge. It was also jagged not only there, but it was also jagged here, like fine saw teeth. So that that further and enhances uh, its strength. And there's no missing there's no missing wood. There are no there are no voids in the there are no voids whatsoever in the wood. Uh, it's absolutely solid as can be. So. There's no, there's no point whatsoever in uh, endeavoring to strengthen that beyond what it is. The same thing up front here. The, 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 break, the break in that stock went essentially through the forward section of this uh, lug right here, this uh, recoil lug. And everything behind it is where, the, is where it, any degree of compression is going to take place, and it's going to be upon the... It's going to be upon the, the fresh wood that's behind it. So there's no there's no issue of uh, any um, tearing or pulling or compressing of the fibers that would in any way violate it. This stock, uh, you know, this this was this was a piece of junk when I first uh, started with it. I could literally twist this stock. Uh, there wasn't much holding it together, and you know, the, as you saw, the the fibers could be splayed. Uh, and and you could you could pull it apart and everything it was a really uh, completely fail, failed uh, piece of wood. Uh, this is back to its original strength. So we're going to put all that stuff away. Uh, we're going to we're going to focus our attention on just simply cleaning up the wood a little bit more. This is a restoration of a uh, antique uh, battle rifle, and so I have no I have no uh, intention whatsoever. Of destroying its uh, heritage or its integrity, I will simply clean up. I will clean up some of the um, glue so that it's uh, basically flush, uh, and I'll clean up the wood. Uh, perhaps smooth it down with an extremely light sanding, and leave it at that because I don't want to destroy the. I don't want to destroy the history of this gun. As grisly as it is, uh, this, as I say, it looks like it has. It looks like it has uh, purposefully uh, applied. Uh, notches on both the uh, underside of the stock and on the top of on the top of the uh, hand guard, you can see the same. You can see the same thing. Uh, they're they're very very they're very very evenly spaced and they look like they were uh, applied by hand. So that, those ta those uh, tell a uh, unfortunately probably a grisly tale of uh, human. Uh, Human, human warfare. So we're going to leave. We're going to leave the stock for the time being. We're going to come back to that afterwards. Um, I'm not going to go through the process of cleaning up the stock on camera. You can you can leave that to your own imagination. What I am going to do is go back to the uh, barreled action. And uh, now we've I've soaked all the other parts. There's no heavy pitting on this uh, gun whatsoever. Uh, this is all just passive passive rust. Uh, that Most of that rust can be uh, removed. For those of you who are interested, uh, this is this was not a cobbled together uh, gun as a lot of uh, war pickups were. Sometimes, you know, soldiers and, and Marines would uh, sometimes share parts and uh, put together one, one rifle from uh, many pieces. But this one here all has the same, uh, they all have the same serial number. And so, it's a it's a good it's a good uh, war souvenir. I'll clean this up, and we'll start putting the gun back together. Okay, as far as finishing up these parts, now the other day we set them to soak in uh, just pure mineral spirits. Nothing nothing more exotic than that. That'll dig into any rust, and it did. It effectively removed all the rust. Uh, what we have left now is essentially just a little bit of dirt. Uh, mineral spirits is not a detergent per se, but it is a it is a, a rust it is a rust remover and uh, degreaser. So it has removed all the surface rust. Um, now what I've got what I've got 
in store for this now to fi finish cleaning it up is just a little bit more mineral spirits before it soaks through this cup and just clean up just to clean up around the uh, places in the, the crevices here to get rid of dirt that's all just with clean min mineral spirits that will uh, brush out the dirt just it's already loosened up and <clears throat> now I'm going to show you a little trick that you can do to uh, enhance this enhance this color right now you can see it looks it looks awesome it's got that it's got that nice blue it's got that nice blue sheen that's not going to stay there because what's going to happen is uh, is as the mineral spirits uh, evaporates it's going to leave uh, it's just going to leave the steel colorless um, so we're just going to make ourselves a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, concoction here I'm just taking mineral oil mineral spirits and mineral oil are two different things but min mineral oil is as you can see it's just a plain clear oil that's all I need now I'm going to take uh, just a tiny bit of mineral spirits and put it into that put it into that oil just a tiny bit I'm I'm talking about probably a less than a three to one ratio and give it a good stir the brush here. Now the point of putting the uh, mineral spirits in it was just to dilute the oil a little bit so that it can get into the uh, pores of the steel. Now the next thing we'll do is we'll we'll warm up we'll warm up those parts. All we've got here is just a. This is basically you know when you when you do that you're making yourself a little bit of CLP. I can put a little bit more mineral spirits in it to uh, thin it a little bit more making a little bit of uh, your own homegrown cleaner lubricant and protectant now the uh, the mineral spirits part just like with any CLP the mineral spirits part will uh, evaporate leaving the oil as a protective coating that's that's how cleaner lubricant and protectant the military stuff works it's just got some mineral spirits in it with the mineral oil and there you go. That's all it is to it. In fact, that's that's exactly what um, Marvel's mystery oil is. I'm going to warm these parts with the uh, torch. Not I'm not going to overheat them. It's just this is not a, a quenching process in oil or anything like that. Uh, this is merely to uh, get this on here. This is this is simply to warm the steel to encourage the uh, oil to penetrate into the into the pores. So it's just a matter of giving it a little bit of heat. I don't want to create any any kind of uh, metal quenching process. Now all that has done is just simply warmed up that steel in that homemade CLP. That will that will get that pot nice and oily. And that will continue until I get all the parts done. Now, if I've got a large pot, such as this one here, that uh, won't necessarily fit into my oil, just take a brush and brush it on. Just a matter of warming up the steel to the uh, encourage that oil to penetrate into the crevices or draw it right in. So this is what you end up with. You end up with a nice shiny this was a sling swivel that was really rusted. And there you go. See how nice that looks. I mean that's that's a thousand percent prettier than it started out. So we're just gonna keep on working with that. We'll do the trigger um, do the trigger mix. Warm it up. The 
if you would ask me what the temperature is on this, if you're bringing it up beyond uh, 200 degrees or so, uh, that, that's more, that's too much. Uh, just, just warm it up, take a brush, and wipe it on. not making nice blades or anything because we don't want to change the temper the temper of that steel. This this steel has been uh, heat treated. Now there were some uh, last minute manufactured uh, Arasakas during the uh, close of the Second World War when Japan was really running out of resources and uh, those those guns were not heat treated. Uh, such, a, such a gun as that is uh, nothing but a uh, relic, and it cannot be, uh, it cannot be safely used. So, I don't know if you can put right into the oil. So any, any of the uh, late issue power sockets cannot be uh, safely shot, but the uh, steel was never hardened. That's it. I'm going to continue through this whole thing uh, until everything is nice and shiny. Here's the bolt. You can you can see how nicely that bolt cleaned up. And that was just with the uh, mineral spirits. I didn't use any I didn't use any so-called gun solvent or anything like that because you know gun solvent. There is no such thing as gun solvent and gun oil. It's just it's solvent and oil. And somebody puts a uh, label on it that says this is for guns. That's a bunch of, that's a bunch of hooves. No, no such thing as that. So, so now I'm just going to heat up that bolt a little bit. Just gently. If I can't hold it, then it's too hot. And you don't want to cause any discoloring of that uh, steel at all. That means you're changing the temper, the temper of the steel. Oh, this is beautiful. This bolt probably didn't look a lot better than this before it uh, went out in the field. Look how nice that, look how nice that bolt is coming out. So we'll just speed up this whole portion right here. Brush the oil on. Look at that. I mean, that's good, but that, that really came out nice. This was a rusted, really, it was a rusted piece of junk when we started out. It was nice, nice and shiny now, and all the rust is gone, cleaned up. The oil is now penetrated into that steel. This watch is good to go for another uh, 80 years. As a matter of note, under no circumstances ever apply uh, any kind of flame whatsoever, any kind of uh, torch to a, uh, a spring of any kind, whether it's a magazine spring or a foil spring or torsion spring, whatever it is, don't ever uh, heat it up because if you change the critical temper, you'll either end up with a noodle that will be completely soft and have no uh, spring to it, or you'll turn it into a, uh, basically, a, a, it'll snap. So, Keep flame away from, just clean these up, that's all you need to do. Okay, let's get into the gun now, this is the good stuff. We're nearing completion. i just warm this up a little bit. Again, I hasten to say, do not, do not endeavor to overheat this. We're not doing any heat treating or uh, metal quenching or anything like that. All we're doing is simply heating the steel to encourage it to accept the uh, oil more regular. And that steel is uh, never going to be in danger of losing its temper as long as you uh, don't exceed. You know, this is, this is like uh, the stuff that goes into your oven and comes out again when you have chicken. You know, you're not changing temper here with your oven, you're just uh, heating things up.
you just generously apply the uh, oil. You're probably saying, well, he's always telling us not to over oil. Well, we're not we're not oiling for that purpose. We're we're uh, restoring uh, metal that had been so badly uh, depleted over the years between rust and abuse. This is just giving it a little bit of life again and when we're all done after this process is over then we'll clean it up uh, wipe it down nicely this is really going to look beautiful I'm very encouraged uh, by this whole process now this doesn't have this gun doesn't have a uh, striker uh, in the uh, it, it's got it's got the bolt uh, it's got the uh, firing pin uh, shroud but it doesn't have a striker so um, you know this this ladder front side, I don't I don't want to touch anything because there's enough heat there it would probably burn me but uh, you know this ladder sight this elevation worked beautifully everything on this gun uh, is is in top uh, working order so and we'll do the same thing with the barrel now the barrel on these I think I may have mentioned is chrome lined steel long before we were ever doing chrome lined steel the uh, Arasaka was the 7.7 .7 model that is and you know ammo is still readily available for this uh, for this gun it was uh, more now than after the Second World War after the Second World War a lot of returning soldiers didn't have any ammo and were converting them to other uh, calibers uh, having them having them re rechambered to other um, things now in this particular case uh, everything is everything is good to go because uh, ammo is being made by quite a number of different companies for the uh, 7 7 that's it so we just keep on working at it and uh, you'd be surprised what this is going to look like when we're done serious rust on something like this you can you can clean it up a little bit with uh, some uh, number one number one steel wool um, if it's heavy rust you can go as far as uh, number two grade steel wool but you, you want to be careful because uh, you can you can go too deeply and um, take off uh, take off bluing unnecessarily um, but on a properly hardened gun like this, and this is this is a very nicely hardened piece of steel. Uh, this was a very formidable uh, gun that was very well made. This will give you an idea of how effective the uh, cleaning process was, with nothing more than the mineral spirits to uh, eat away at the rust. And remember the bluing is actually a form of oxidizing of the uh, steel, much like rust, but it's a controlled rusting process. So basically what we've done is uh, we've cleaned it up with the uh, mineral spirits and then <clears throat> brushed it up as well as we could to get the dirt off. Heated the metal uh, gently with uh, the torch. As I say, just, just beyond the point where, it's, uh, where you're able to touch it. Um, 
but you don't want to you don't want to remove any tempering or cause any uh, distortion of the coloring or the, or uh, warping of the metal by any means. This that's not the process here. Then just simply wiping it down with a diluted uh, mineral oil that has uh, a few drops of mineral spirits in it to uh, thin it down a little bit so it can impregnate the uh, pores of steel. Get into the in other words, get into the crevices here and wipe it dry. Wipe it wipe it completely off. Uh, what you're going to be left with is sufficient amount of oil to uh, protect that uh, for a long, long time. So uh, that's all there is to it. It's um, very simple, easy to do, and we're going to get this gun back to uh, very usable condition. I want to show you how simply the uh, Mauser style bolt extractor goes back on. This is a uh, controlled feed extractor. As I said, you can find these on uh, any Model 98 Mauser. Um, you can find it on uh, Model 70 Winchesters. The the back of this the back of this extractor has got a uh, undercut right here. So it's a uh, key slot, and that goes back onto this. I can move this into the view here. This goes back onto this rotating ring. These two ears. Now position that so that it's on the side opposite. You can see there's a there's a groove around the there's a groove around the uh, face of the bolt, but on this side is smooth. You want to position that so that it's on the smooth side, and just place the get that positioned. Just place that like that, slide it down over over those ears, pick this up with your finger until it rides up onto the bolt. Can you see how that is? And now all we do is just simply turn it towards the groove and you can hear it lock into place. So that's your that's your controlled feed extractor, Mauser style extractor. We're finishing up the job now. I'm driving these bushings gently back into place, just flush. This is, by the way, a piece of uh, German silver, which uh, is used in many operations when you're building a Smith and Wesson revolver. So it's always good. Uh, it's always a good piece of thrift material to uh, place things in because it won't it won't dent. Deal. Okay. Now there's a third one. There's a third one here that goes into this last this last hole right here, and that secures the top and the bottom of the uh, stock together. So we're going to put that. We're going to slide that dovetail back into place. Watch carefully how I do that. This uh, it just slides in. Just like this, and it comes to a stop. Place the uh, sling swivel, the side sling attachment, right there. Got two. Got two screws of the same length. There are three short screws. I want to make sure they're all the same length because you can't assume they are. Uh, as a matter of fact. One is uh, definitely shorter than the other. That will go into uh, that'll probably go into this top hole right here. So find my find my screwdriver. Here we go. And you need not worry about the fact that this butt plate uh, is is loose. That's the way it's designed. The combat and works just fine. And it will stay. It will stay for uh, forever. Now, actually, before I put those into place, I probably should be checking to make sure my rear bushing goes in and mates up. Now it's time to use.
use my German silver and get that finished. And that is a pin that now secures the top and bottom stocks together solidly. You see it comes out right through right through the bottom here. So that it looks like a it looks like an ugly crack, but that's the way this is designed, and that is very, very firm and solid. So now we'll put the uh, butt plate back on. And this is a very long screw that goes down through the end grain. End grain is not uh, is not the best means to hold the screw, so put that in there. You don't have to tighten these down like crazy either, just uh, just snug tightness. There's no torque setting. When the screw stops turning, stop turning. That's all there is to it. So now <coughs> we'll put the um, rear tang support in place. That's this. That's this piece of steel right here. And I'll be back with the rest of it shortly. I think you can figure out where we're going now. Anybody who's taken apart a Mauser knows exactly what they're doing with this gun. It's the same, the same action, and everything works identically. Well, in about three days of restoration work, which involved a lot of uh, glue drying time and um, soaking of uh, badly rusted parts, what we've got is, I think it came out really nicely. Um, we've got an operating firearm now. Went from being a, a gun which had a jammed bolt. Uh, it had, it was demilled. It had a piece of, I, I didn't know what was in the chamber at first when I first started working on it. I didn't know if they had poured, somebody had poured lead into the chamber. Uh, heating the chamber up did not allow anything to uh, melt. Uh, but I noticed I was getting some burning effect. Turned out after I did some work that uh, it was a, a dowel that had been epoxied in. Far better it had been lead. Um, so that was a big that was a big uh, problem getting that uh, dowel out. Fortunately, this barrel is in gorgeous shape. The the barrel is uh, bright, bright, bright uh, with deep rifling. Uh, the crown is in great shape. There's no there's no nicks to the crown. Uh, as you can see, the the steel is really nicely restored. Um, the uh, there's a rich luster to it that wasn't there before. Before it was it was just plain rusted and dried out, and uh, it had a lot of surface pitting. A lot of it was superficial, but uh, the floor plate now is uh, black. It it just looks great. No uh, no rebluing was done. The bolt is in great shape. Um, it's got it's got this. It's got the standard military-style follower that does not uh, permit the uh, bolt to go forward on the last after the last shot is fired. That you know, if you ever were sporterizing a gun like this, and this is not my rifle to sporterize, but if you ever were sporterizing a rifle like that, you just simply taper the back of the uh, follower. You can just look at any Remington or Winchester or Savage, any gun that's got a, a follower like that, rather than catching the bolt. It, it allows it to just slide over it. Um, but this ladder sight uh, works beautifully. It just it glides up and down now. I can put it in any position I want. I'm sure that that's I'm sure that's measured in uh, meters. Uh, everything is in good shape. The only thing that's the only thing that's lacking is the cocking piece. Uh, I do have the shroud for the uh, firing pin that I found inside the bolt. And that was um, that's this piece here. So really, all I need to have is uh, a, a firing pin spring, 
and uh, the caulking piece that goes on the end of that. In all likelihood, I'll probably end up finding uh, finding the firing pin group more easily. Uh, but now I did not want to uh, I did not want to alter the uh, characteristics of its its uh, battle worn nature. That's that's the way this gun came. Um, I cleaned up the stock in terms of getting dirt off it, and uh, but I just left I left its own character the way it was. Um, but the sling sw the sling swivels are in good shape. They're they're operating now rather than being jammed. Uh, the bayonet lug is in good shape. There was actually some paint on this gun that had been uh, spattered on it, which took some time to get it off. But that's it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. You know, anytime you run into a gun in the store that looks like it might be a little bit ragged around the edges, take a really